Amy Sharma. I'm the executive director of Science for Georgia, and I am super pleased that you all could be here today to come learn um, how to speak up for science. Uh, so, um, right, and uh, please do feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, so, without further ado, we'll get going. All right, so this is me. Uh, I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. I was a science and technology policy fellow for AAAS up in DC for a year. Uh, and then I came back down to Atlanta and I was worked at Georgia Tech Research Institute for about six years. And then I was a product manager for um, two startups in town. So that means I've spent my whole life bridging the divide between audiences and stakeholders. And so that's essentially what you're doing when you're trying to talk to someone about your science and trying to get it used in the public sphere. Um, you're bridging a gap. So now it's your turn to save the world. Um, and we're going to learn how today. So in that way, it's always helpful to know how the government works. So we're going to get an introduction real quick to the U.S. federal, state, and local government and how kind of power is shared between these three places. So uh, in the US, federal laws take precedent over state laws, which then take precedent over uh, local laws. So this means federal laws are typically kind of more vague. Um, they set guardrails for states to operate on, and then the state sets its own guardrails and then on and on and on. So, when it comes to affecting your everyday lives, um, I know that we pay the most attention to what the federal government is doing, but what's happening in your local government has more direct input on what's going on in your life. Um, so this, uh, a few of the slides here in this presentation are from a fabulous intern, Johanna Wright White, and I want to give her props for making these slides for us. Um, so, in a nutshell, you know, we have laws for all Americans and then for all Georgians and then for local residents. So here's how two topics um, can be handled. So if you think about, um, say, education, right, the federal government tells us how we can improve academic achievement and ensures that everyone gets a high quality education and they give out some funding. And so then it goes down to the state. And so the state creates a system of how to fund its schools, um, and it has appropriations through to all the different school districts in the state, and they develop state educational criteria. But then at the local government level, this is where funding comes from. And, um, and then this is also like the local school boards are what sets regulations for teachers and things like that, right? So you can see it's like, growing in kind of vagueness down to very targeted individuals. Um, so there's three branches of government. Um, this is basically the same at both the state and the federal le level. So the legislation, the legislative branch, uh, this is Congress, this is the Georgia General Assembly, um, they write laws. So if we were gonna talk about taxes, um, Congress, or the state government are, are going to write a law about taxes, about tax bills, like what the tax rate is and how it's going to um, and how people are going to pay it and things like that. But then it sits down to the executive branch, enforces the laws. So if we sit on our tax example, the executive branch, which is headed by the president at the federal level or by the governor at the state level, they're enforcing the laws. So Congress wrote this tax bill with tax code, and then the executive branch is, has the IRS, and they're going to go out there and they're going to collect ta taxes, and they're going to execute what Congress wrote in the bill. And then finally, uh, the judicial branch is going to interpret the laws. So this is where they decide if that IRS tax, or if the tax bill is constitutional, or if the way that the IRS is collecting the taxes is in line with what the law said, right? So they're interpreting the laws. And so then how does a bill become a law, right? And um, 
If you haven't watched the I'm Just a Bill video, you should really go embrace that nostalgia and look it up on YouTube. But um, from Bill to Law, basically what happens is citizens, you and I, talk to legislators about an issue that they care about. And again, we're, we're legislators, right? Because they're writing the laws. Um, so then legislators draft a bill um, to address this issue. And so in the um, in the Georgia General Assembly, then this bill gets assigned to a committee. And so then the committee has um, public testimony and commentary about this bill. Um, and so a uh, fun fact is you can go down, you can watch a bill that you care about and you can go down to the Georgia General Assembly. And if the, your bill has a hearing that day, you can sign up and as a citizen of the state, you can speak about this bill. So anybody can go down and testify. Um, so then if it gets passed out of committee, uh, it goes into the rules committee. And then if it gets passed out of the rules committee, it goes up to the whole uh, house or Senate for a vote. And then once it passes through either the house or the Senate, it moves over to the other side, right? So if it was a bill that was in the house, it passes out of the house and then it goes over to the Senate. And then it goes through the same rigmarole in the Senate where it goes through a committee and then the committee looks at it and then they pass it and then it goes to the whole floor for a vote. And so then if it passes both the House and the Senate, they have to come together and they have to talk about it because if uh, the versions are different, they have to reconcile them. And then it goes back to each chamber so that the final bill is passed. And so then if the bill is passed, it goes up to the governor or the president, depending on if this is federal or state. And it has to be passed or vetoed. Um, and uh, the Congress or the General Assembly can override a veto with a two thirds vote. Um, and so, and there's something called a packed pocket veto where if the president or the governor don't sign the bill within X number of days, it is pretty much essentially vetoed. Um, so that's how a bill becomes a law. So it's kind of a messy process, but the important thing to remember is that it starts with you. Um, and if there's something that's really important up to you, you need to be talking to your legislator about this process. Okay, so now I'm gonna run through some numbers for you to kind of put this all in perspective. Um, there are 33 or 330 million people in the US. Um, at the federal level, they are represented by 435 representatives, 100 senators, and one president. And this is old data. Um, but so it costs $5,000 a day to run for Senate or an hour if you're running a presidential campaign. This is the amount of money you have to raise to run a successful campaign. Um, uh, average campaign for a national office is about two years. Um, and about 250 constituents contact either their representatives or their Senates over a day. And so and this is the fun fact here, is that an average legislator staff remains on the job for less than eight months, right? So these people are, have a high turnover. Um, and then in Georgia, there's 10.8 million people. And so we're, we're, we are, as a state, at the federal level, represented by 14 representatives. And there are about 770,000 people per representative. And but you have to remember each district is very important, um, very, very different. So in these districts around Atlanta that I highlighted, District 4 has a median income of $47,000, whereas District 6 has a median income of $92,000. Um, but they're both very urban districts. If you go down here into other parts of the state, District 2 has a median income of $37,000 and it's 66% urban, and District 12 has a median income of 43,000, and it's 60% urban, right? So if you look at this based on just where people live and what their incomes are and what they, like, what's happening in each district is vastly different across the state. We did um, get a new set of districts based on the 2020 census. Um, and so here is a map of the new districts. 
Um, I grabbed this. This is the only map I could find online, which is kind of embarrassing, but it's from uh, 538. And so this shows which way each of the districts should lean um, based on votes. Um, so that's the federal level. If you go down to the state level, there's 56 in the Senate, which is the upper house, and there's uh, 180 in the House of Representatives. So the Senate represents about 192,000 people per district, and the Senate or the House represents about 60,000 people. The legislative session is happening right now. It goes from January to April. It will end the first week of April before the masters. That is the cutoff, the masters. Um, so if you were paying attention to those numbers, uh, you might be thinking that, oh my God, how do I matter, right? Like I am just one and at a minimum of 60,000 people that is represented by this one person down at the state house. Um, so, so why do I matter, right? Um, and it's really easy to get cynical about this and think that one person can't make a difference. Um, but but you, you do, you have a lot of power, right? One, um, as members of the science community or just science-friendly people, um, people trust us. This is a known thing, so you can use this to your advantage. And the bigger thing to remember is legislators, right? There are over 1,300 bills in the, U in the Georgia House right now. That's 1,300 bills. They are not experts on any of these bills, right? Like they don't have the time to read them all. Um, they take on so many issues a day, right? Like someone might call them about a farm issue and then someone might call them about a zoning issue. And then someone might be really upset about being able to charge their EV car, right? Like it is just all over the map, right? So they're not experts on anything and they welcome your help. And also because... Um, you bother to speak to them, they're just going to assume in the back of your head that when you speak, you represent the views of many registered voters, right? And they represent you. They would like to get reelected next time. And so you need to use this to your advantage to think that people are out there and they want to listen to you. So now, this we're just cruising through this. Um, we do want you to write a letter or send a tweet um, we do want you to speak up for science. Um, so what really goes into a good letter or an email or a phone call? So first, introduce yourself. Um, this is very important. Uh, if you're writing your representative, say that you live in their district, right? Like this is um, now with all of these email, these programs out there where people can just flood the inboxes of legislators everywhere, they don't really like it unless they're hearing from you who lives in their district, right? Like they represent you. Um, if you have professional qualifications that are relevant to what the letter makes sense of, please state those. If you don't, it's great to just be like, I live in your district. Um, again, you're going to tell them this nice little personal story, right? My Aunt Louise lives near an unregulated tire dump, and she now has chronic asthma, right? Um, the fumes inflame her systems, right? So you need to really explain. Now, if you don't have a nice personal story, don't make one up. That's not cool. But, you know, if you've got anything that connects you personally to this, please share it. Okay. Take a stand and give them own. I ask you to support programs to reduce illegal dumping. This is important because, right, one point per letter and a very clear stand on what you're trying to tell them, right? This is best practices. They, you can be like, I need you to support these programs. I need you to not support these programs. I think this is very important, right? You want to bring it to their attention. And then... You know, personally connect yourself. Did you meet him at a barbecue? Um, this one I'm looking at now is kind of, I voted for you last fall because of your commitment to jobs. It's a little, little hokey, but um, um, anyways, but do make sure that you kind of, again, be like, hey, you know, even if it's just like, hey, thank you for all that you do for our community, right? Like that's a really nice thing to say. And it's true. You should thank them for what they do, hopefully. <laughs> um, so remember, one point only, you must sign your letter or email. 
anonymous letters get you on a watch list um, and you don't want to be on a watch list. You really do have to be like, I'm Susie so-and-so and this is my address and I live here. Right. Um, if you're sending them a postcard and you don't want to just like put your address all over a postcard that everyone can read, you can put, you know, your full name and the zip code that you live in. But please do tell them who you are and where you're from. Um, okay. So if you send them a postcard, it's pretty much the same as a letter, except you've got less space to say it, so be very clear and concise. Um, you can tweet at your representative. Um, they will not follow any links that you send them, but you could be like, hey, Representative Smith, vote no. Um, the only caution on this is your entire social media history is public. Um, so if you spend most of your time bashing the government on your Twitter feed, then maybe tweeting at your representative is not an effective way to get their attention, right? So think about that before you send it. Um, and so if you're going to send a postcard or a letter by like snail mail, make sure it's not for something urgent because it's going to take a while for it to get there, right? Post letters are like super powerful and impactful because you took the time to like write things on a piece of paper and find a stamp and put it in the mail. So that's going to be very impactful and they're going to pay attention to it. But if the vote on it is tomorrow, then you got to send an email or you got to do a phone call because it's just not going to get there in time. Um, <clears throat> so how is your letter received by the staff? So uh, this is for the Georgia General Assembly because it's only in session from January to April. So if you're reaching out to your Georgia state representative or Georgia state senator, if you're talking to them in January or April, only be talking to them about a current issue, current issue or a current bill, right? Because they only want to know if you support it or you don't support it. And you want to make sure your stand is very obvious, right? Because they're in the thick of it. They're in the now. They're looking at those 1,200 bills that they have to like get through and wade through. So they just want to know, do you support it? Do you not support it? Is this really important to you? May through December, that's when like if you have an idea that you think should be a policy and should be addressed, that's when you reach out to them because they're not in session. And so then you have a, a subject that, they're like, oh, wow, my constituents care very deeply about this. Um, be declarative and give them something to do, right? Um, so I'm going to give you an example. In the north part of the state, uh, there's um, a problem where people are illegally dumping the waste products of animal processing. So this is disgusting, right? If you woke up and next door, there was just a field full of uh, chicken heads right, which is happening in the north part of the state. And so a few citizens have been working on their local representatives to write a bill to make this illegal and to give um, local control the ability to enforce the fact that this is horrible, right? Um, and there is now a bill before the um, Georgia General Assembly to do just that, right? So again, these citizens started with their legislators in the off season, they were working with them in May through December to be like, hey, this is a problem. This is really gross. We got to fix this, right? Um, and now there is a bill addressing it, right? They didn't start on them like January 15th because then it's too late, right? So they started in the off season. And, but this is, you know, an example of there was a definite problem and it did need a policy-based solution and it's now before the Senate, right? So this does happen. Um, and I cannot emphasize this enough one topic at a time. Don't send them like a 30 page email with 30 subjects in it. Just one at a time. Please, please be respectful. Um, please, you can be passionate, but don't be crazy. Don't call them a murderer. Like be very respectful. They are, they're human beings on the other side of this wall. So, um, be nice to them. Um, so now that we've done that, it's your turn to save the world because you can. Um, what we're again looking at this year uh, is Science for Georgia. We're focusing on education um, in terms of evidence-based literacy. 
Um, for water, we've been trying to help save the Okefenokee Swamp. And, um, and we, are, we have been talking about these soil amendments, um, which are those chicken heads. And we are working um, on food security around community task forces. Um, so these are all things that came out of the roundtables that we discussed last year, right? And so we started conversations with legislators about, hey, these are problems and here's what science evidence-based solutions are. Um, and the reason we're focusing on this is that um, here's an example of how this is all connected, right? So, and this is just disheartening, but uh, weather, so this is how global warming and all of those things are attracted to the food cycle, right? So weather extremes increase pathogen loads, which strip away nutrients, um, from the soil, which then, um, so then we have to use more pesticides and fertilizers. So then we have more CO2. So then we've got higher temps and then we've got more spoiled food and then we've got food supply disruptions. And then we have to transport things more, which causes even more CO2 in the atmospheres and on and on to higher costs for less healthy foods, right? So there's multiple places in this chain where we can make an impact on both uh, climate change and on food security, right? If we have improved farming practices, you get decreased emissions and runoff. It gives you better resiliency to um, extreme weather, which means, and then it also gives you increased nutritional content and then improved profitability and lower costs and healthier food, right? So if you look at things one way, and of course this takes a while, Right, so food security is one of those things that takes a while because it's not an immediate, like, quick in your done fix. Um, but this is what we have been looking at with a lot of our, the people we've been talking to is, you know, vicious cycles can become virtuous cycles. Um, mistake number one, if you say positive feedback cycle, it sounds like it's a good thing, right? And we all know global warming is a positive feedback cycle, but that is a bad thing, right? So say it's a vicious cycle because you're talking to a normal human who doesn't think in science terms. Um, and that economic incentives really help people change what they're doing. Um, there was a study that was done that showed um, plastic bag bans are not nearly as effective as just charging people 10 cents a bag. Um, right. So that's a great thing to look at. And that as you look at statistics and you can improve things with um, increased transparency. So this is kind of how we've been talking to a lot of people about how we can get to the evidence based root of problems. Um, so. That was a lot of talking. Um, I'm really good at that. Uh, but you can be a part of making science matter. Right. So. You can join our letter. If you go to this bit.ly Science for Georgia action link, um, uh, there's a few of those topics outlined, and it also gives you more details on how you can write an effective letter um, It's um, and how to effectively communicate with your legislator. So you can um, jump on that. Uh, there's three weeks late left in the legislative session. So you can go learn about some bills that are really important to you and write a, a letter about that right now. Um, you can swing by our booth at the Atlanta Science Festival uh, Expo in two weeks. Um, and we will have postcards there that you can fill out about anything. Um, so that's how you can get involved. So that is it. Um, also, we do need you to take the survey because um, that'll help us and Atlanta Science Fest Festival um, do even better next year. Thanks, everyone. Go forth and speak up for science. Bye. Mm -hmm.